Greg. So um, thank you for joining me again. And so what we're doing today, we're going to talk about ways we can enhance your strategy and implementation um, over at Love and Faith as you uh, uh, in your role. Um, what I want to do is start with four recommendations for ways to enhance strategy and implementation. And then if you'd like to talk or have questions or any feedback, we can do that. And at each point where I stop, you're welcome to do that. I want to make sure we have enough time to um, answer any questions you may have or uh, add any ideas or thoughts you might have to the recommendations, and that's fine. This is more, like I say, even though I'm making recommendations, it's still open for feedback. Right. So I'll give you the first four that I came up with in terms of um, ways to enhance strategy and implementation. And the way these are written is basically, it, it points back to the conversation we had before about strategy and implementation. So even though I may not be using the exact words, the basis for it is I'm responding to what you said the first time. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, we'll do the first four uh, ways to enhance strategy and, and implementation. And I think you guys may be doing this, but I will say this. The first point is that you definitely want to review your current strategy. So that would be point number one. You want to review your current strategy. Um, and point number two you want to consider and evaluate what works well within that strategy and what does not work well in that strategy. So reviewing the strategy and then analyzing it. Is it working? Is it not working? What works? What doesn't? Get yourself a picture of, of what's going on. Um, yeah. Your third point here is going to be to discuss it with your leadership team. What needs to change and what doesn't? I think this sometimes is where leadership can get off. Sometimes we sometimes we'll miss this point because we're so focused on evaluating what's working and what's not, but we may not always address what needs to change and what doesn't. And this is where your organization really thrives if you do it right, because it gives you the ability to adapt to your environment and and provide what's necessary at the time. Right. And then the last point for this one is going to be what are the best ways to implement the new changes? That's another point. So the point number three is always hard. Sometimes we miss it altogether. And then even when we do get number three, sometimes we don't always look at number four, which is what's the best way to implement just because we have a plan to implement what's being suggested doesn't mean we're doing it in the best manner. And so we have to evaluate that as well. Maybe we need to make some adjustments to the way we're implementing changes so they can be more effective. So I'll pause here for any feedback from you, questions, thoughts, comments. Okay. Well, I'll just give you my thoughts on the, 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 I'll go through them one at a time, which I think that I really believe they're all good and they're all important. Uh, reviewing the current strategy, that's something that um, we, especially after COVID, I think is very necessary. We have the tendency to pick up where we left off. And especially when you're talking about something as, um, something as, uh, what's my word? Uh, for lack of a better word, for something as important as changing in changes in leadership, mm. so you, you you just can't. Um, if you had a person in there and they were doing a job, <clears throat> excuse me, whether they were the leader or one of the members who served with the leader, it's hard to when that when one of those two elements is gone, it's hard to just plug somebody in and pick up where you left off. Uh, so, and you do need to review your current strategy. What are you doing? Um, how is it? How, how can you, can you do it the same way? Um, when you have such a drastic uh, gap in time, like we had with COVID, if it's just somebody, um, okay, they moved away and, and you know, this has happened. You're a member. 
loving face. You know this has happened. We've had leaders that life changes. We've had leaders that had to take care of their parents, yeah. and their parents lived in another city or another state, so they had to leave. You know, go take care of their parents. Their mm -hmm. jobs, their jobs required that they had to leave and go work in another city or another state. And when you have the the leadership functioning from that capacity, you can you can maybe put somebody in there and and you don't miss a beat. But when you talk about the big layoff in time and resources and structure that we had with COVID, it's different. And so yeah, we I think when something like a COVID happens or a mass exodus or a mass layoff or then you have to review your current strategy. You have to see, and, and I think that's a good time to review your current strategy because you may have seen some things that, well, you know, that's really not working. We're doing it because that's what we've always done, but it's really not working. So you review the strategy. Then we need to consider and evaluate what works and what doesn't. We, we really do. And we got to be open and we got to be honest about that. I think that, that's the only way being transparent and being honest is the only way we're going to get the right ideas, the right strategies, and then we put them into place. But we, we have to consider and evaluate not only what's working, but what's not working. And then we have to look at what's not working, what can be done better with what's not working. So let's not just point out the problem, let's, let's implement solutions. Because some things you don't have to change, but some things you will. But you'll still need to uh, find a replacement for the thing that's not working. Uh, discuss changes with leadership. Very important because you and I talked about it before. Communication is so key in leadership. And, and it might be a person that's the reason or their behavior or their attitude toward things. That might be the reason why some strategies aren't working. And we may have to relieve that person of those duties. We may have to get someone else in to fill that void. But it shouldn't come from, that should be a, a, a counseled fault. That should come from a group of people and not just one individual. And then what's the best way to, what are the best ways to implement? And that's another thing that should come from a, a, a group setting and everybody bringing their ideas to the table. What's the best way? We know we need to change. We've considered, looked at everything we're doing. We know we've got what works, what doesn't. We need to change what doesn't. Now, what are the best ways to implement those changes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Understood. Um, I think that's good. Let me ask you this: in in your experience with not just the church, but with um, leadership in corporate world, have you felt like these steps that I'm discussing have been able to to be implemented? I think so. the 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 problem that in the corporate world and it. It, it it all depends on the leadership. It all depends on who it. It sounds simple, but it all depends on who's in charge. Because we, there'll be those who will overlook the problems. They'll overlook what's going on just for the sake of getting the job done. It's almost like the end justifies. If if we're you know yeah I'm having a problem. Sorry, Terrence, I was doing something there. Mm -hmm. I'm having a problem with. Getting invoices out. I'm having a problem with uh, getting shipping done. I'm having a problem with supplies. I'm having a problem with a bunch of stuff. Um, then, okay, then we consider and evaluate what's working and what doesn't. Then we find out, well, it's it's a human problem. And then, okay, let's evaluate what's the human problem. People aren't properly trained. Okay. Then let's talk with leadership about what do we do to get them the training we need. They need. Do we keep bringing in new people? Okay, let's let this guy go and bring in somebody who knows what they're doing. Yeah, but then he's not trained. As we discussed before, you can't take somebody and even, and I'll give you a prime example. I've worked with SAP 
the uh, enterprise system. I've worked with SAP for over worked with it at three different places. And every place I went, I knew how to navigate SAP, but I had to tailor my training to what each individual business did. That's true. And so, and, and I feel like that's the same with any corporate setting or any uh, church setting is that, yeah, because you were, a, a, you were a finance manager over there and you dealt with uh, clothing. Now we're dealing with chemicals. And even though you understand the finance and, and how it works over there, yeah, you got the back, you've got the foundation, but now you got to get the training over here. But if management says, oh, just bring them in. And then they say, well, he's got, he, he's got a background in finance. Yeah, but what type of materials was he working with? Bring him I in think- and say, oh, yeah, he's a finance guy. He's great. And you plug him in and he doesn't know. Um, he doesn't know a sweat sock from caustic soda. So, but they're two different things. And he's not sure how to handle them. He just understands the foundation of finance, but not to understand, but not the foundation of the the uh, elements that represent your company, the, the, the products that represent your company. All that to say, uh, it can work in a corporate world, but management's got to be open and willing Take those steps, and that, and I've worked at places where they just take more, they they see things, they see the job being done, the end justifies the means, and they don't look at they they see you crossing the finish line, but they don't see how many obstacles you had, the unnecessary obstacles sure. you had to come overcome to get there. So, so this, as long as you cross the finish line, they're good. This this brings up something that that. Um, all organizations deal with somewhere, but that I feel like is really critical is that the small inefficiencies in our systems can really hurt us down the road if we don't get rid of them or we don't try to minimize them. Um, I agree. And, if, if, yeah, go ahead, Terry. I was going to say a little leaven leavens a whole lump. You know, as you allow something small to build, it can become an insurmountable object. It it, it 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 becomes an insurmountable object, and it's like we've always been taught because you're from my generation. We've all been taught that, that you don't cover up a problem; you solve it. Right. Because if you cover it up, once you uncover it, it's still there. Yeah. When you solve it, it's gone. Right. And and what you see is a lot of cover up. You see mm-hmm. a lot of you bring people in, and they've got again, they've got the foundational background that you're looking for but you don't know how well versed they are with your product or your material. Yeah. And with that, and with that being said, or your business, right. you may not even be working in a soluble business. You may, it may just be numbers. It may just be um, uh, anything. It, it may just be publications, but you know, but you, you say, okay, they've got the foundation. They, they know, they understand that part, but what is the, what is the meat and bones of your business? What what is, what is the thing that brings in the profit? It's not just the guy that knows the finance; it's the guy that knows the books that that bring in the finance. Well, and, you you bring a good point in, Greg. I mean, to cut you off like that. Sorry. Yeah, good. You're good. No, no, you bring a good point in because where we miss it is the differences in our industries require that we're nuanced to know those differences and to adapt to them. We have to have some knowledge of the product or service we're providing in order to close the gap where needed in order to um, what whatever it is, whether it's sell a product, whether it's to um, market this or market that, you know, knowledge is power. And so having understanding of generalities is okay. But when we say, I don't need to learn anything else, that's where we really hurt ourselves because there's always more to learn. There's always something different, especially if I go from one business to a different business and it's in a different industry, it's going to be, there's going to be a learning curve. And if I go in and do this, like I did that, it may not work the same. And I think that's what you're speaking to. So I did want to address that because I know, I know we haven't um, posted this yet, but when we have listeners on this, you know, they need to understand that all businesses aren't the same and they don't all run the same. And and I think when, if, if as a, 
and and I'm glad you said that, Terrence, because I think it, I'm, what I'm learning over time is that it works both ways. Right. Because the employer needs to know this when he's hiring, but then the employee needs to know this when he's hired. So right. he needs to come in and, and say, although I got the job and I have the foundational things that they're looking for, I need to gear myself towards learning as much as I can right. about this business, what my job, what we do, who we, what we sell, who we sell to, whatever, whatever, and whatever my job, it may not even be selling, but whatever my job is, I need to come in and put myself to a place of learning and and growing and getting to know what we do here. But on the flip side, as the employer, I'm trying to provide the resources for the employee to be able to do that. That's exactly and what I and what I see is that employers bring people in, and we may have mentioned it the last time we spoke. Employees bring people in and they say, Oh, just watch what so and so does. That's not training. That's not no, that's no. not the formal a structured training that an individual needs in order to be effective and productive for your company. And it's no different. And, 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 you know, switching back to the body of Christ, that's just like you and me and somebody bring them in and, and, or I, I meet somebody just got saved and I say, Hey, well, Terrence around and watch what he does. He's a good man. He, he's got, he's got this job where he deals with a lot of people. He's smart. He, he you know, he's an intelligent brother. He's a good uh, a role model for you. Watch what Terrence does. You'll be fine. And then now I've stuck him on, on her on you and you're trying to live your life. And now you've got this person following you, shadowing you. And the thing is, we're not perfect. Right. So therefore, um, I, I talked about this with somebody I know, especially on my job, the tendency is to, we deal with apparel and we deal with the data of apparel. We don't produce, mm -hmm. we don't manufacture, we just deal with the data. And when new people come in, the, the, the catchphrase is shadow that person. But you got to remember, I've been there for almost 13 years. You got people that's been there for almost two, three, four, five years. So they've developed a system outside of the standard that it just helps them do the job quicker. It's just knowledge from experience. That's something that you can share, but it doesn't always translate as well as structured formal training. I, I agree with you there. Um, you hit something really good, and I am going to go to my next point, but I want to say this because it's all in the leadership literature and it's powerful for organizations, and it's called having a learning organization. There's a, a book out called The Fifth Discipline, and you can look it up. I think it's Peter Singer, but mm -hmm. um, don't quote me on that. I think Singer is the name. But what it, that book talks about is the organizations that do the best are organizations that are always learning. They promote learning within their culture. And they provide resources for learning, something you just talked about, um, formal training and things of this nature. What we don't, when we don't invest in our people, we we lose on the back end because we're going to cost ourselves in terms of human resources, finances, lost time, inefficiency. So I'm just going off the cuff, but um, I did want to say that, drop that in there, uh, but I got to move on because our, our purpose is to go to other things, but 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 I, I'm glad we talked about those things. I want our, our listeners to think about the things we're talking about as they lead organizations. Um, so the next point is that um, I'm going to share my personal and professional philosophy on strategy and implementation in your industry. You know, we're dealing with mega churches. Um, and so we understand, you know, you can't run the church without God's guidance. So. Um, number one is to seek the guidance through prayer and worship of God. We we, we have to, we can't lead God's people without Him and without His strategies and and vision. So that's very important. Um, the next step would be to share the revelation of your vision with your team, and this is where you can see the difference between the fake leaders and the real leaders. Mm -hmm. The fake leaders withhold knowledge so they can manipulate. 
real leaders humble themselves and share so they can um, empower their team. And there is a great difference. There. Um, and then the other part, um, good, I didn't even realize I put this here, said discuss the practical challenges and the nuances that can affect implementation. And we kind of talked about that in the last frame of, without even realizing we were there. There are practical challenges and, and nuanced things that are going on that can affect how we implement our strategy. We need to know what they are. We need to discuss them. As you begin, this is number four, point number four. Right. As you begin your implementation, you got to, again, evaluate what works and doesn't work. And then number five, adapt your strategy as needed to fit the needs of the specific congregation you serve. So I don't know. I wrote these this morning, and maybe I'm recycling the same points over and over, but I don't think we can get away from continuing to evaluate whether what we're doing is working or not. Um, John Maxwell talks about it in his leadership books and in a lot of his uh, growth books that we always have to evaluate what we're doing because experience doesn't mean anything unless it's experience that we learn from. That's a good, I mean, that's a terrific quote and it's so true. Uh, we need to understand just what uh, we need to understand the, the the people that we're serving and serving with, yeah. and it it that's the common denominator of any business, whether it's a church or a business or a home. Who I. I, I have wrote down some some things about leadership that the Holy Spirit has shared with me, and He reminded me, Greg, you're always, you're going. There's always going to be a leader in the four pillars of the community, and they are work, home, church, and education or school. Whether it's middle, high, elementary, college, every one of them need a leader, and. And the leader has to be a person and the common denominator in all of those is that there are people involved. And when you deal with people, you've got to have some degree of knowledge about them. You need to know who you're serving and who you're serving with. Uh, and, and to me, like you were just saying about uh, knowing the different business types, knowing the different models and structures, you need to know what you're supposed to be doing yeah. because there's a vision for one place. And this works with businesses too, because they have business, um, they have mission statements, business vision statements all over the place. But there's a, there's a, there's something that you're supposed to do. And then there's something that they're supposed to do. And you could both be selling shoes, but you've got a different, vision you yeah. got a different mission and if you don't know what it is then if i'm if i'm uh uh shoestring the shoestring business trying to do the velcro business's vision and mission then it's not going to work because they have something different to do just like we have something different to do uh yeah. Yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. That's that, and that's. I think is part of what you were saying about the strategies. If we want to take it all the way back, review your current strategy. First of all, your strategy has to come in line with whatever the mission is yeah. of your organization. Absolutely. What's the mission of your organization? And your strategies need to rally around and build support and equip for that mission. That's and absolutely true. Through. And then you go through the other things that you spoke of, because if I know what the mission is, then I'm expecting you to provide me with the strategies. So that's why as the worker, I'm expecting you to provide me with strategies. So as the leader, we've got to constantly be reviewing our strategies because I want to put these guys in the best position to be effective. But if what we're doing ain't working, then we got to stop doing that and find something and not just say, well, we ain't going to do that no more. Now we got to find a solution. We, we found out the problem. Now we got to find a solution. Well, and no, no, go ahead and finish what you're saying. Oh, I was just going to say, and then we can follow the other steps that, that you have here, the other strategies uh, we consider and evaluate what works and what doesn't. Here's what we're doing, equipping 
these guys to complete our mission. Absolutely. And if it's not, then we got to stop doing it. Period. <laughs> I, I'm laughing because we have organizational ADHD sometimes, if you know what I'm saying. You're absolutely right. We 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 lose focus of our mission and vision. And that's when we get into trouble. We've got to go back to that and 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 like you said, wrap our strategies around our, our mission and our vision. Sometimes it's about back to the basics, right? About back to the basics. And then to your point, then we got to communicate the mission. That's it's true. not enough for me and you. Okay, we're leaders. We and I are co-partners. We start this business. And then we know what the mission is. But it's like, okay, so the guys that we hire, do they know what the mission is? Or are they just do that, do that, right. do that. This right. is your job. Do that. And that's fine if you want to get the job done. But if you want to equip, then you got to tell them what the mission is because yeah, sure. they'll take more uh, responsibility if they realize mm -hmm. not just, and I'll just use a simple warehouse, for example. I'm not just stacking a box to get it off the floor and to get a paycheck. I'm stacking a box because every box I stack gets shipped out. And when it gets shipped out, the things, the resources that are in those boxes make somebody's life better. That's it. They put them on the truck. I get, and I do it early enough that the truck driver can get out on the road. He can beat traffic. He can make this stop. And then the other stops he's got to make because he's got an agenda too. If he doesn't work for me, then he's got an agenda too. That's true. So he gets his job done. I get my job done. And whoever receives that package benefits in the end. That's amazing. I like what you did. You know, you, you, you talked about the practical and that's, that's, really important. And that was what I was saying before. If we don't, if we can't make the vision practical, if we can't make the strategy practical, I mean, we're just working on instructions, but uh, I, I think it's important what you said. That was great. Now we're, we're a little limited on the time now at this point. So I do want to kind of move towards a conclusion, okay. but I will say this. Um, as we look at possible research topics, on strategy and implementation. I think there are some good literature out here for a person like yourself, Greg, who is working within the framework of the church and doing it God's way. So I'll give you three um, titles and you can, you're feel free to look at some more stuff, but I think these three will be very foundational. Okay. Um, one is a book by Blanchard. I think it's Ken Blanchard. It's called Lead Like Jesus. Don't know if you've ever heard of that book. I had not. It's a really good book. We used it in our program here. Um, talks about how Jesus leads and how we follow. Um, there's another book, Robert Greenleaf, uh, Servant Leadership. Really powerful. I have not read that one, but it's very foundational in terms of servant leadership. And then and let me know if you need me to repeat them. But this is the Just third the author of that second one, Robert Greenleaf. And that was servant leadership, correct? Yes. Okay. Got it. Um, and the last book, um, the five languages of appreciation in the workplace. I, I think you've heard of Gary Chapman before, right? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Gary Chapman and Paul White wrote that one. I'm reading this book right now. And, um, I've gifted it to um, three of my staff here because I want them to implement this. We can tighten our team up, strengthen our team here. And I feel like it's really a good way. So those are some things that I think will, will help. Um, and there's there's more out there if you like. I just don't have them in front of me right now. Okay. This is, this is fine. Um, I, I'm going to drop a few things in here before we go and then you can add any comments before this thing cuts off um <laughs> we got about seven minutes <laughs> yeah i see the time on there kind of <laughs> the clock is ticking um so some emerging research questions that i'm thinking of are you know what are the challenges that mega churches have in implementing strategy i think that's a big one for you guys that's the it's, and that, it's a simple one, and we've talked about it so much. Just the unwillingness, unwillingness to change. One, <laughs> that, of, that, one, of the, <laughs> one of the biggest challenges 
the implementing strategy is that people are so caught up in the way we've always done things. And <laughs> there's a and and to this day, Terrence, it amazes me how um and I'll just say it like this people ain't afraid of the devil, but they scared of change. You know what's that's funny. <laughs> you know what you just did though, right, Greg? You you went into question number two already. I mean, research question number two already. Because the, que the, the second question is what makes people resistant? And it's probably just because they don't like change itself. So they, I'll put they, that they don't like change. <laughs> and I don't know if they feel like, I think with some people, they feel like change eliminates their presence. Mm. And and it either eliminates their presence or it causes them, and I, and here's, and thank you, Holy Spirit. This is what I really think it is, Terrence. It causes them to become uncomfortable. That means now I got to learn something else. Now mm -hmm. I got to do something else. And I'm just fine in my seat of status quo. But now when there's change, how will that change affect me? Am I going to have to get up earlier? Am I going to have to study more? Am I going to have to, you know, it's, it's, it's like the change is requiring something else out of me. And I really don't want to give any more. That's what I that's what I think is one of the reasons. It's really, behind. really fascinating to me. And and I want to make a comment and then I want to get to the last one. My sure. comment is that we live in an era and a and a time in our history where we have to adapt or die. We don't, we don't, we don't, you know, and no people might not agree with me on that, and that's okay. I'm willing to stand on on the hill and die on the shore for that one. But my my thought here is that we don't have the option to be status quo anymore. Things are changing too rapidly, too exactly. quickly um, for us to stay where we are because if we don't adapt to what's going on around us, we're going to be irrelevant. So we've got to make the decision to learn, adapt, and change. Um, and, and here's my third, it leads me into my third question is, Greg, what are the changes that members of mega churches are most willing to accept? What do you think they are? That's my research question number three. You might have to dig for that. <laughs> the the ones that, I, and I'll just use my own experience, the ones that, and, and you know what, Terrence, it really depends. It depends on, and, and certain times, sometimes the demographics are involved. And mm -hmm. I say that because like for our, I'll speak for our church, our seasoned saints, you just talked about adapt or die. And they are at the point now where they're ready to learn technology. Very few of them are, um, are afraid as afraid of it as they used to be. And they want to learn and they want to grow. But yet we've got a, a segment of young people who don't want to know anything other than technology. And so the, the past experiences and the way we had the, the hands-on, the manual, that can give you a greater appreciation for the not so manual. So I, I, it's my belief that the two, and, and one of the things I'm trying to do in, in my term of leadership is bridge that gap. Oh, one of some of the things that I think they will uh, adapt to is, is, I think they'll adapt to anything a little more tech savvy. I think they'll adapt to, here's, it's, it's good in a way, but it's not good in a way. I think they'll adapt to what's comfortable for them. I think they'll they'll be quicker to reach out to something that's comfortable, mm -hmm. but they but the 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 downside is there's got to be some uncomfortability when it comes to ministry. There's, yeah. there's going to be some unsettling. There's going to be some of that when it comes to ministry. The thing that I I wrestle with as a leader, and I wonder if you wrestle with as a leader, is the the concept of receiving your promises without conflict. I just don't think it's possible. I don't think it's, um, I've been following the Lord for many years. And since a teenager, I've always recognized that in order to be really blessed, you're going to have to step into some water that's um, not parted yet. You're going to have to step into the Jordan and see the fish roll by you and trust that God to help you get over there. Uh, that's just my personal right. opinion. And um, I've seen God do it over and over again. But I'm concerned that we have people that are still afraid to put their feet in the water. But when you don't, you can't go anywhere. You can't go anywhere. And I think with that, um, if we're always, if if I want God to make it easy every single time, then what's going to happen is I'm never going to know who he really is in tough times. 
Right. I'm just going to know who he is when I want it to be easy. And and it's like I want to win before I've even played the game. Right. And sometimes you got to get in the fight. Sometimes you got to get in the fight and be on the verge of losing before you see the hand of God come in and win and give you the victory because <laughs> that way you know it's him <laughs> and not you. But if I'm always trying to have the yeah. victory, and I know I understand we fight from victory, but sometimes right. we go in – Asking God, give me the victory and without pain. Give right. me the victory without suffering. Give me the victory without persecution. And because and then that's your mindset. If he did it that one time, then your mindset from that point on is I don't want to go through God. And you never really know who he is. I know him as a victorious, loving God, but I don't, I can't really say I know him as a healer if I'm not sick, so he can translate me from being sick to being healed. It's wild, man. Um we 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 are afraid we're afraid but we're afraid. but what you have to recognize uh you have to be able to like you say humble yourself and try it anyway to go forward you, you won't get anywhere without taking a risk but that's 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 the hard part right that's but hard. i I don't know. I have my own thoughts. I don't want to go any further on that. But I think this has been a good conversation. This thing's about to cut off. I didn't know if you wanted to to kind of just talk a little after or if you're good or what. Yeah, yeah, we're fine, man. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, if it cuts off, we're, we're A-okay. I can log back on or you can call me or however you want to handle it. Okay. I, I think I got what I needed, man. I really appreciate your time today.